I'm going to talk this morning on the mechanics of tower installation. Now most of us are interested in towers. Most of us have installed towers. Climbed them, put beams on top, and we find that we're fairly proficient in that as radio amateurs. We follow many of the rules that are set forth in the manufacturer's uh, catalogs in designing foundations and uh, guy assemblies. But the uh, question always comes up, what if the circumstances do not quite comply with what is laid out in the manufacturer's books? When those things happen, it's quite important that we understand the mechanical nature of a tower, the wind loading, and learn how to determine what the actual stresses will be in that mechanical structure. There are those who say, well, just pour lots of concrete, use lots of guy wire, and it'll stand up. There is a principle of mathematics that mathematicians call the N and S conditions of proof of a mathematical equation or principle. N and S means the necessary and sufficient conditions for a proof. We may extend that same philosophy to towers. We need to give the tower the support that it is necessary to give, but only that which is sufficient. If you go beyond that and over design, your costs run up. If it's a very large tower, those costs can certainly be great. In order to study this, and, and this is a technical discussion, this is not for entertainment this morning, rather for information. We need to determine what mechanical quantities that uh, we must investigate in our search to find adequate but not superfluous design for the tower installation. To assist me, I have prepared some slides that I'm going to project for you, and I hope that they will help to illustrate my talk. In order to project the slides, I'll have to dim the lights here. <coughs> <coughs> this is only a test pattern. Don't uh, take that as to be a demonstration of what your tower is supposed to look like. <coughs> now, if I can just find the correct key on this little remote control, we will go to a slide. <coughs> Now here we're going to talk about some mechanical properties that are very essential. They are very fundamental. Most of you understand these things. We talk about force. Force is defined as a quantity, a vector quantity, meaning it has direction, <coughs> which when applied to an object tends to produce acceleration. And I've drawn a picture here of a big block of something with a force bearing against it. And if nothing else restrains that object, it will begin to move in the direction that the force drives it. Now, we talk about the word pressure. Pressure is force distributed over an area. We speak in terms of pounds per square foot or pounds per square inch, depending upon the units that we are using. Another quantity that we are very involved with in the study of towers <coughs> is called moment. Now, moment is what occurs when you have a force applied off-center of something. It's a force which tends to produce rotation of that object. Here is a tower of sorts, and we have a 
force up here at the top. Perhaps we have a beam antenna up there, and the wind blows against that beam antenna. And the tower is self-supporting. It's anchored in a concrete foundation here. And at the base of that tower, we have the maximum of a quantity called moment. And a moment looks like this. It's as though forces are tending to twist this thing around, to pull up on the windward side and bear down on the leeward side of this tower. We can calculate moment by saying it's the amount of this force in pounds multiplied by the length of this tower, or this moment arm, in feet. And the answer is in foot pounds, because we're multiplying pounds by the number of feet of offset. We don't have much uh, recourse to the calculation today of moments, because a tower will span only so much beyond that it will break. The other quantity is called stress. Now, stress is a quantity that tends to distort the shape of some device. Here I've drawn a picture of a bow and arrow. When you stress that bow, you're producing stresses in the material of the bow. They are elastic stresses. It's an elastic deformation, we say, because the bow will return to its original shape as it's released. If you <coughs> overstress the bow, it will fracture. If the bow is made of something that is not so elastic, then it will deform. It will take a set, as you say. It will become bent and stay that way. And that is when a material is stressed beyond its elastic limit. This is the way it is with metals, most metals, unless they're extremely hard metals. They will ultimately take a set. They will bend and stay bent. If you go beyond that, they will rupture and break into <coughs> pieces. <coughs> Another slide. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> These are special kinds of stresses that we find applied to the materials, particularly that we'll be working with in terms of towers. We have compression, compressive stresses, pushing together. I've shown uh, pressures or forces pushing together on this block, and it compresses it. It makes it tend to swell out that way. And that is a compressive stress. Tension, tensile stresses, tend to deform a block this way. That is, it tends to thin out. Stretch a rubber band, you will see the action of tensile stresses and deformation. That way. A third type of stress that we are involved with in towers is called shear. This is where, uh, as I've drawn here, you have a bolt holding two metal plates together and you pull apart and it will tend to shear the bolt right along this plate. Shear stresses. So those are the three primary types of stress that we will look at. We ask ourselves, what is the strength of these materials? The strength is defined as the ability of a material to resist the stresses without destructive distortion or breaking. This thing is a radio device that changes the slides. It's just really slick. All right. We we'll talk about wind blowing a bit now. <coughs> the, uh, the pressure.
pressure applied to any device out in the wind is given by this little formula I have written. Can we have just a little bit of light so we can see the technology? Uh, yes, let me see if this will. No, I don't want to, don't want to spoil it. Is that enough? Sure. Okay. <clears throat> And don't hesitate to ask me questions. I, I don't mind being interrupted. Uh, a formula to give us the pressure of the wind on an object is right here. P, the pressure in pounds per square foot, is equal to 0 0.004 times the velocity squared of the wind in miles per hour. Now, on a flat surface, such as I've drawn here, here is the cross section now of a, a flat surface, <coughs> this is the amount of pressure that you will find. Now, if the surface is cylindrical, as I've drawn here, <coughs> there is applied a rounding factor of two thirds. This is because of the streamlining effect, we might say, of the wind flowing more gently around the contour of a round cross section than the situation on a flat surface where the wind impinges directly on a flat surface and has to sharply flow around it. So we have only two thirds as much pressure exerted on this round surface. Now, for the surface, when we do this calculation, we take the projected area, the shadow area we sometimes speak of. It. That is, uh, uh, the, the diameter of that would be the projected area. We don't consider uh, the actual uh, surface area of the circle that way in making the calculation. We simplify it quite a bit by saying, all right, we will use just the cross-section area and apply the two-thirds rounding factor. <coughs> Here is a tabulation of the wind speed and the pressure on a flat surface that it will exert. You notice that at 70 miles per hour, 19.6 pounds per square foot. At 80 miles an hour, 25.6. 90 miles an hour brings us 32.4 pounds per square foot. 100 miles an hour, 40 pounds. And 110 miles an hour, 48.4 miles an hour. Now, in specifications, for building construction and the like. The, the typical design for at least the Dallas-Fort Worth area is for a 30 pound per square foot wind loading on a flat surface. This corresponds to 86.6 miles per hour of wind velocity. When you read the applicable uh, EIA specifications that I have here with me, a copy, <coughs> of the Electronic Industry Association's uh, specification called RS-222, which is entitled Structural Standards for Steel Antenna Towers and Antenna Supporting Structures, and is the defining document that an engineer would use when he is uh, doing the design of a tower, let's say. It has a long tabulation in there of the expected basic minimum wind speeds for uh, all areas of the country. In the Dallas-Fort Worth area, that basic, uh, the, what's called the basic minimum, is 70 miles an hour. However, <clears throat> in the uh, case of storms, we may get momentary gusts that go well above that, as most of you uh, fully understand. And so the typical design uh, 
by a um, uh, civil engineer who is uh, designing buildings and other things that are exposed to the wind, will take 30 pounds per square foot as the, uh, as the design criteria. And we'll say that corresponds to 86.6 miles per hour wind velocity. Now, let's take the case of a beam antenna. Maybe we have a young fellow named John Q. Ham who uh, decided he's going to build his own um, uh, Yagi, and uh, he decides to uh, build it this way. <clears throat> he's making the driven element of it, the center element, consisting of 20 feet of one and a half inch aluminum pipe with an additional 13 feet of one and a quarter inch tubing, which would just slip inside it and he has clamps. The uh, director will be 20 feet of one and a half inch with 11 feet of one and a quarter, the <coughs> director being just a little bit longer than the driven element, or, or rather a little shorter than the, uh, uh, than the driven element, the reflector a little longer having 15 feet of his one and a quarter inch tubing. He's made the boom out of 20 feet of three inch square stock. So let's just quickly run through a little calculation of what this area is for the purpose of wind loading calculation. <clears throat> we have a total of 60 feet of this one and a half inch uh, one and a half inch tubing. We have to convert this over into square feet, so uh, one and a half inches is one eighth of a foot, 0.125 feet. So we've got 60 feet of that times 0.125, giving us a shadow area of the material there of seven and a half square feet. Now he has his one and a quarter inch tubing. 39 feet total of that from the dimensions. And one and a quarter inch diameter is 0.104 feet, so we have 4.06 square feet with a total element area of 11.56 square feet. The area of the boom, because we must consider that we're talking about the wind coming from the lateral direction of that, just to check on it, is 20 feet of a quarter of a foot, we said that was three inch square stock, gives us five square feet. So you see the wind loading from a wind uh, in this direction would not be nearly as great as the wind loading from this direction. Actually, there is an angle to which this is turned that will give the maximum wind loading. It's not either straight to or, uh, or with the wind directly uh, <coughs> parallel to the elements. But uh, let's just go ahead and not try to complicate this thing any more than it already is. <coughs> All right, let's, uh, let's go in and calculate now what the wind load will be on this uh, antenna. The wind force perpendicular to the elements, then we'll calculate by 30, that is 30 pounds per square foot. 30 pounds per square foot times 11.56 square feet of element area times 2 thirds because they're round. Remember our rounding factor of 2 thirds that must be applied here gives us the wind force of 231.2 pounds. That is what our uh, 30 pound per square foot uh, wind 